This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. kind of disjointed this morning. <laughs> I got my message ready for next service and was like, well, stink, what am I going to preach on? <laughs> um, and so I started looking through my stuff from college and other stuff I've grabbed and grabbed one book from my president of the first college I went to and happened to grab a second book that happened to correspond, and I don't have a library that corresponds. <laughs> so it, it was God's providence, and when I started looking through the book, books, found out what I was teaching on. So we're going to learn how to study the Bible this morning, um, and why to study the Bible. So the book I'm using is Searching for Treasure, or How to Study the Bible, by Dr. Everett Bernard. He's a strange old bird, let's just put it that way. Um, good friend of my pastor growing up. He was my pastor's pastor. Um, and so, as far as I know, I haven't heard any otherwise. Um, but full of wisdom, very caring, and knows how to t- teach on this subject for sure. Um, here's his opening. The greatest kindness a parent can do for his child is to teach him to stand on his own two feet. The greatest kindness a preacher can do for his people is to bring them to spiritual maturity so they can feed themselves spiritually and they can face the problems and gain victories on their own. Therefore, the greatest kindness that I can do for you as your preacher is to challenge you to study your Bible and to teach you how. Alfred Lord Tennyson, the great English poet, said, Bible reading is an education in itself. The great Southern general, Civil War, said, In all my perplexities and distresses, The Bible has never failed to give me light and strength. Horace Greeley, the great newspaper publisher, said, It is impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible-reading people. The principles of the Bible are a groundwork of human freedom. John Quincy Adam, our our second president, said, So great is my veneration for the Bible that earlier that the earlier my children begin to read it, the more confident will be will buy my hope that they will prove useful citizens of their country and respectable numbers members of their society. I have for many years made practice to read the Bible through once every year. If more of our people would do that, it'd be great. Second Timothy two fifteen Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, God tells us that we're supposed to study his word, and oftentimes we feel we're just left, okay, I was told to study, now what do I do? Well, first off, we need to pray that we're going into it with the right heart. Um, Pastor Sen down in Denver says, for our devotions, that they're for us to meet with God where our heart meets with God's heart in devotion to Him. It's accomplished by adoration, worship, and prayer. And number two is for God to meet with us where God meets with our hearts through the reading, meditating, and studying of His Word. And the Bible, the Bible is God's means of speaking to us while prayer is our means of speaking to God. See, I look like it. I look at it as going to my dad to learn. My dad's not going to teach me on a subject unless I ask him what I want to learn. Um, this week, I was working for Kayla's uncle um, Daryl down in the Hudson area and doing tile flooring and putting in some doors. And growing up under a contractor dad, I knew a good deal on how to do stuff. 
Growing up in church, I know the Bible, and I've gone to Bible college, but there's still questions that I often need answered. So when stuff arrives down on the tile job, I called my dad up. Hey, what do we need to do for this? Because I can't remember how to do it. And he ran me through the steps, and from what he told me, I could go on further. God does the same thing with us. Is Lord, I have a problem in my life. I need to study it. Show me what I need. And sometimes you'll need to look for a reference to say, look here in this passage. Other times you'll be doing your daily devotions and just your heart will be on a problem. And you might have read that same passage a thousand times, but this time it meant something different. See, the Bible is a living book. And so it changes for each person according to how they're reading it and what point in their life. Um, Somebody who isn't saved yet might not necessarily get the intricacies of what a great promise that actually is, of I just need to know this God so I can understand this. And that's where um, Dr. Bernard starts off. He says, if you're not saved, that's the first thing Bible study is going to do for you is get you saved because otherwise you're not going to understand it. You're not going to know the author and what he means to be able to apply it to your life. But once you're saved, then there's a whole other form is using questions of who, what, where, when, and why to how does this apply to me? Who is the Bible talking about? Why is this going on? Um, When is this actually happening? And those really tie into helping us understand what's going on. I mean, if you look at the time of Judges, there are totally different times in the New Testament of what's going on. There was a, uh, oppression from other countries, totally, but during the time of Judges, the Philistines were not a gracious people to live under, where the Romans were actually very nice people to live under. Let, them, let the Jews do basically whatever they wanted. So we have to know the context of what's going on. Um, And so we can't know that unless we know the the Savior personally and he's able to speak to us through what's going on. Otherwise, he's just saying, get saved and I'll talk to you. (laughs) And then once we are saved, we have to believe what we're studying while we're studying it. The Bible is verbally inspired word of God, holy without error. It must must be believed to be understood. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please, please him. Study regularly and comprehensively, not spasmatically. See, the Bible is a soul food. Job 23.12 says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Matthew 4.4 4 says, but, the, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of his mouth. Dr. Bernard is one of those men that, he'll go to bed early because he's older now, but he's up at four in the morning, if not by five, studying his Bible for an hour and a half to two hours, studying and praying, and oftentimes he'll skip breakfast. Um, I do it just because I get busy and don't remember what I'm doing. (laughs) But it was such an important thing. Well, and Pastor sends the same way. I've been down at his house and woke up and he had been up for two hours studying his Bible every day. Um, Just great men of God that have gotten down the pattern of, I need to study God's Word to be able to grow closer to Him. And they'll tell you themselves that they are no great scholars. Um, but they are living in God's word so much to the point where they will go beyond their humanly needs to satisfy their spiritual needs. Um, every, Christian, bleh, every Christian who can read should read the Bible daily. Every adult should read the Bible through every year. And that can be done by reading four to five chapters a day for about 20 minutes. Um, Pastor Sen understands also, he agrees that we need to read the Bible through constantly, um, but he's broken it down to where, like as a student, you read the New Testament or the Old Testament through in a year, um, just because of how busy our lives are anymore, of 
it is a poor excuse, but we also need to keep our priorities straight. So at least if we can get through a testament a year, by the end of the year, you're pushing through the next one. Um, so it, reading through the Bible um, is just an important thing for us. And not that topical Bible study isn't great, but God wrote an expository. He wrote us a story on how he created the world. And then he chose a certain family and went down through that family. And that family rejected him. And so he chose the rest of the world to love him if they would just... that He chose the rest of the world to love if they would just love him. And gave us a great love story. And we choose to talk about prayer. But I wanted to talk to you about all of this, not just that one topic. So we can do topical studies aside from our daily reading, but we need to be able to focus on everything, not just one thing, because a lot of people get focused on revelation of, this is all going to be great, and I want to know how this is happening. But most of us as Baptists believe we're not going to be here for it. So what good does it do for us to know what's going on in Revelation? Yeah, it's nice to know the promises that are coming, but that's all for the Jews, not us. So we need to be focused on what we're reading and applying it to ourselves. And if we can't apply it, it's good to know. But either figure out how to apply it or focus on something you can't apply. We need to study with a seeking heart, looking for God's promises to claim if you see something that's for you, write FM b- beside it. It's like, that's for me. See, we are saved. If we are saved, we can claim God's promises. And there's plenty of promises through his Bible. Um, 2 Peter 1.4 Whereby are you given to us exceeding great precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Psalms, excuse me. Psalm 68, 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvations. Selah, or think about it. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And just constant promises throughout the Bible that we don't know them if we don't read our word. And if you're not reading your Bible through and just going topically, you'll miss all sorts of promises. But if you have those promises, you can say, hey God, you said you would do this for me if I asked. You said you load me down with benefits daily because you are the God of salvation. Where's my blessing today? Show me my blessing today. And he's required to do so. Oftentimes we don't have faith that he will or the knowledge to have the faith that he will. We're supposed to look for the principles to apply. Um, Genesis has the 12 I wills of God. Genesis 17, 1 said, And when Abraham was 99, no, I can't read. When Abraham was 90 years old and nine, so yes, 99, (laughs) the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, "I um, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and thou wilt be perfect. God said, grow up to a man that was 99 years old, and there was still a need for improvement. His name was changed from Abraham, or sorry, Abraham, high father, to Abraham, father of many nations. Um, And see, when Abraham surrendered completely to the I wills of God, or I will do all these things for you, he was given a son. Look for commands to obey, not loopholes to squeeze through. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. That's John 2, 5. Matthew 28, 18 and 19 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you to do. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. Oftentimes we think, well, that's for that person. I don't have to do that. Um, well, he told me to do this, but you're not really that great a person, so I don't think you need to be doing that yet. Um, 
Give God everything. He's not going to tell that person to do what he's telling you to do. So don't worry about them. Worry about yourself and do everything that God is convicting your heart on. Um, I know pastors that said, I don't have a TV in my house because it's not right and you shouldn't have a TV either. Well, if you're a news reporter, shouldn't you probably have a TV? (laughs) If you're a news reporter, you probably want to have a TV in your house to keep up with what's going on. Um, Same thing with computers. Those things are of the devil. You don't need a stupid computer in your house. Well, the libraries are kind of going closed anymore. I need to research something. You need to be able to work on your own heart and not force it on somebody else. Study with a seeking heart. Samuel Clemens, or Mark Twain, said, It is not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. John 7, 17. So God will not give us more light or more truth than we are willing to use. Because to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him it is sin. If we go out camping and I'm out looking in the woods and say I take Andrew with me, I'm going to have a big flashlight to focus on what I'm doing. He doesn't have a big attention span. I'm going to give him a little mini mag light. So he's got a light to kind of see where he's going, but he's not going to use that whole light anyway. God's the same way with us. I'm not going to shine down on you all of this light because you'll just go blind. I'm going to give you what you can see and focus on at the time. So like I said, if we're unsaved, the Bible's not going to show us the path to God. The Bible's only going to show you the path to God. If you're saved, it's going to show you the path to pleasing God. Um, what time are we supposed to end? Okay. I didn't want to go into the next section. Then. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Bernard calls them the workman's friends. Mr. Who, Mr. What, Mr. Where, Mr. When, and Mr. Why, and Mr. How. So... He opens with 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself to prove unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to study so we can divide what is right and wrong in our lives. Mr. Hoofs wants to know the human author of this book and statements, for instance, Paul and the epistle to the Gentiles. So Romans 11.13 For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I am magnifying my office. That needs to be remembered when reading his books. Also, also the Bible is true, but there are lies recorded in the Bible. So, everything in the Bible is true, even the lies. Does that make sense? The Bible told us everything in the Bible. God's not lying to us, but the devil lied. He lied to Eve. Did not God say? Yes, God said. But it was this way. So that lie is true that it happened. So everything in the Bible is true, even the lies. Um, you must have the author as a tutor to understand it. Second Peter one twenty. Knowing this, first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. John sixteen thirteen. How be it that when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, the of private interpretation, God's not given anything new under the sun. There is no secret revelation that I'm going to get from God in a dream that hasn't already been said. So I'm not going to start my own religion. But he might bring something new into my life. But that happened over there yesterday for that person. So we're we're nothing special. We're dust. So dirt's everywhere. Doesn't really change much unless you come to a new area of the country 
Otherwise, it's all the same. Same thing with this. You're not going to find anything new in that dirt unless you go to a whole other place, and then it's going to be applied differently. If I'm studying how to solve one and work on things of reaching other people, there's topical studies on that all over this country on you should go door knocking every week or just live your life to show God in your life. You're going to offend somebody by knocking in that area of the country or go to China. But I'll get killed if I go door knocking. I better just live it and maybe they'll ask me about it. We've got to apply things differently, but it's not different to God. He said to reach the world. He didn't say everyone has to reach it the same way. And so he'll show us how we're supposed to reach the world in our lives. But we have to have him telling us how to do that or learn from that region. Paul did things different than John did. Was one of them wrong? No. Did they agree with everything? No. They're two different people trying to do God's will the way God's showing them. And oftentimes we do the same thing as, well, that church over there is doing that, and that's just wrong because I don't do it. That makes a lot of sense. They're seeing souls saved. When was the last time you talked to someone about Jesus getting saved? Maybe we need to look on our own hearts of, Lord, what am I doing wrong that people aren't talking to me about you? We have to focus on God talking to us so that we can talk to others. We need to study regularly and comprehend. Did I jump back? No, that's the same thing. Okay. Sorry. Um, so, Mr. What? Mr. What wants to know exactly what happened, all the surrounding circumstances, all the participants of the, and the ramifications, and its final purpose. Just the facts, ma'am. Nothing but the facts. Mr. What examines the text Mr. Watt examines the text in its context like a crime scene. He is careful not to disturb the evidence, but is careful to examine, collect, catalog, and consider all of the evidence. So he's not taking something out of context. There's a bullet there! Someone was shot! It hasn't been fired yet. God's preparing something for somebody else in a foreshadowing. So somebody might get shot. But you can't pull that out and use it as a promise of, we need to do this. Focus on what is going on in where you're studying. Um, Mr. What would read Exodus 32, assemble the facts and then rightly conclude the key phrases of who is on the Lord's side. That's the focus of that portion, and you'll find that in verse 26. But you wouldn't get that if you focused on verse 27 or 25. Mr. Ware loves maps and atlases. He wants to know where something was said or done. He wants to know where the speaker was coming from and going to. He wants to know whether the audience is a local or transient. Because Christ would go to certain areas, but he also had hundreds of people following him. So what's going on? Who is he talking to? Is he talking to the audience that's following him, or is he talking to the Pharisees that happen to be there and he's kind of making fun of, and they don't get it? Um, Mr. Ware can tell you which missionary Paul journeys, uh, which missionary journey Paul was on when he preached at Mars Hill in Athens, because um, Acts seventeen twenty and twenty one. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, that these things mean. Because for all Athenians and all the strangers which were there, spending their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. That's all they wanted to do. They'd go to Athens so they could learn something. It was a focus on knowledge. But if he were in Jerusalem, they were focused on going up to the temple. So different people. And... We have to study where are we at when we're reading this. Um, well, I'll get to that. <laughs> Mr. Wen is primarily interested in chronology or the timeline. He wants to know what happened first. He wants to know when the statement was made. 
There is a principle in Bible study called the law of first references. From the first time something is mentioned in the Bible, God will not change his mind about it all the way through the Bible. For instance, if you do not study the life of Christ chronolo chronologically, you can believe that Jesus cleansed the temple once and that there, and that there are, are therefore discrepancies between John's account and the accounts in the synoptic gospels. Actually, there are three years between the two cleansings of the temple. Jesus went up to observe the Passover in 27 AD and cleansed the temple and kicked out the money changers. In John 2, 14 and 16, and he found the temple and those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sittings. And when he had made the a scourge of small cords. He drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and, and poured out the chargers of money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. He acquired some powerful, unforgiving enemies and the religious leaders. And then in 30 AD, cleansed the temple again to those same enemies and they crucified him. So, we need to know that two things are happening at different times. Or as I was reminded last night studying, or probably realized last night studying, Jesus goes up to Andrew and Peter and says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Short story. Later on, no, oh, don't want to get that wrong. I think it's in John. It goes into the full depth of the story. Christ was out preaching, and there was a horde of people following him. And he says to Simon, same name as Peter over here, take out your boat. I know you're cleaning your nets, but take out your boat so I can speak to all these people and they can hear me. So he does, and tells them to cast out their nets. Man, we've been fishing all night and didn't catch anything. Do it anyway. They catch a draught of fish, call over their friends. Hey, we need help. They get back, hey, I will make you fishers of men. That's the same story, but in two different places. That one just has more depth. Genesis 1, God created in the heavens and the earth. God tells us how he did it. God created man and how he did it. They aren't separate long timelines. It's just focusing on a topic, how he did it. Or sometimes it's cleansing the temple. If I cleanse the temple here, I had to do it again because they didn't get it the first time. So we need to focus chrono chronologically on what's going on and where we're at. Mr. Y is the most childlike of all these workers. It is not that he doubts anything God's saying. It's just that he is always asking why. Why was the earth made without form and void? Um... Why is the universe so large that it takes light from the furthest stars over four billion years to get here? Why did God give Adam and Noah identical instructions? Go forth and replenish the earth. Why does God repeat? And God said, and so it was so. Seven times in Genesis 1. Why does it say in Genesis 1, 2, and the earth was without form and void, and then say in Isaiah 45, 18, that he created it not in vain? Why does... Mr. Y does not challenge, he questions. He wants to know, why did this happen? So God can answer it. If we don't ask why, we won't get the reason. Why do I need to get saved? Because Adam sinned. Why do I need to get baptized? Because it shows that you're a child of mine. We're not going to get it if we don't ask why. We're not going to be able to understand our Father if we don't ask him the question, what he wants. Mr. Howe is the engineer on the job. He wants to know how Noah built the ark. He wants to know how the Tower of Babel was built. He wants to know how the children of Israel went through the Red Sea on dry ground. It is not that he does not believe in miracles, it's just that he insists on eliminating natural explanations first. If the Bible says it was a miracle, then it was a miracle. But if not, he looks for a cause that is adequate to produce the effect. When studying your Bible, employ these six willing workers. They are well worth your time, to, well worth the time you spend on them. 
If you don't use those questions, you're going to get a minimal study. I can only read my Bible for five minutes and I don't get anything out of it. Did you ask a question? Were you looking for something in it? Or did you just open up a spot in your Bible and say, there, that's the verse I'm reading today. God can use that if you want, if he wants, but more than likely he won't. Start with Proverbs. Reading the Bible through a year isn't the easiest thing to do. But if you read Proverbs every month, there's 31 Proverbs in, in the book. So you've got one for every day, and some months you get more than that. I don't know how many times I've read Proverbs, and I'm still getting new stuff out of it. Because our life changes. And it's an easy one to stay focused on. Hebrews is the same thing as you can, or James. James is the same way. That great wisdom in there. Just keep reading through those. And it's a great devotional to help me focus on getting my time built up that I can read that long. Reading a psalm in there with it is a joyous thing. Some, some of them are sad and you can mourn with them. But most of them are happy. They, they lift you up that you are able to, man, I want to read more so I can find out more about this thing. But if we're not asking the questions... We're not going to get anything out of them. So what tools do we need? Well, for one, a good study Bible. Um, Dr. Bernard recommends the American or the Dixon, Dixon Study Bible, the Schofield Study Bible, which he preached out of, um, the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, which is what I use, the big one there. My wife took my small one. And the Knaves Topical Bibles help also. Um, but um, talking with Dr. Bernard, he says, use it when you need the topical study Bible, but otherwise don't use it as your everyday. Um, you need a good English dictionary. Um, at the time, he recommended American Dictionary of English Language, No Webster's 1828. Good luck finding that in Wyoming. Um, my wife and I use Merriam-Webster's Dictionary <coughs> Online. Yes, some of the um, diction the references have changed, uh, definitions have changed, um, but online anymore, they typically, if you look through to the middle of the list, they'll show you the oldest ones that um, are more congruent with what the Bible's saying. Um, a good Bible dictionary... Um, as well, along with an English dictionary. Um, he recommends the Zondervan Pictorial Bible Dictionary or the Unger's Bible Dictionary um, by Merrill Unger. You can find small little Bible dictionaries, but about the time you get actually studying your Bible, that thing was useless day one because it doesn't give you enough information of, well, what was this place? That one's not in there. It's pretty generic on the small ones. So if you're going to do it and get a good Bible dictionary, get a good Bible dictionary. That way you can actually understand the topics. Get a good Bible concordance. Um, the two he recommends, and the, for sure I recommend number one, is the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Um, every Bible college I went to and have visited all used Strong's. It is not the easiest thing in the world to use at the beginning, but the more you use it, the more you understand it. I know Marlon, as he was pastor, when a kid graduated high school, they would give them a strong concordance to help them with their studies. So I think I've got three in my house. <laughs> um, Kayla had one and I had two. <laughs> um. But the Strong's has every word and every verse in the Bible in it. And it also gives the Hebrew and Greek roots for every word in the Bible. So you can keep up with Jason. He's talking all lot Greek. <laughs> um, he also recommends Cruden's Concordance because it's a small paperback concordance that you can carry with you. Um, it's not necessary, but a good Bible handbook is um, nice to carry with you also. Um, ones he recommends are Haley's Bible Handbook or Babel, Baker's Bible Handbook. I mean, that's a hard one to say. Um, these books basically give an archaeological 
uh, corroboration of biblical events. And those ones are probably outdated by now because archaeologists anymore are wanting to prove biblical accounts, and they're doing so. Um, the most recent one that I remember hearing is in Egypt. They said there's no way the Jews could have been there as slaves because the Bible said they built their places with straw bricks, and there's nowhere in Egypt built with straw bricks. They went a little bit further south, like the Bible said, and they found a whole city buried full of buildings with straw bricks. So a Bible handbook will give you some of those things, and even just certain areas online, um, which isn't in his booklet for one of those reasons. Um, they'll give you research on what is going on in archaeology that's proving the Bible. If you talk to Marlon, he can give you about 10 of them. <laughs> um, a good Bible atlas. Now, most of your Bibles will have maps in the back, but a Bible atlas will show you in depth of what's going on in the story of, um, be it the crucifixion walk of where did he travel that night, or the journeys of Paul, um, where the, is, the Hebrews traveled across the wilderness. They'll show you those maps so you can understand regionally where you're going. Um, the ones for Paul really make sense because it's showing he wasn't just in this one small area. He was all across southern Europe, and each one was different. And you can, excuse me, you can use the atlas to be able to use the archaeological and tie things in. Oh, that all makes sense now that I know what's going on, where, and when. And I can ask the why because I know the when and the people there, the who. Um, he recommends a good Moors and Folkways book. Um, it's called A Manners and Customs in Bible Lands. Um, so it's another one of those things of why were they doing that? Um, we watched the thing on Passover a couple weeks ago of what are they doing for Passover uh, feast? Well, they're saying that, and this has to do with that. And so, when, like when Christ was crucified, he folded the uh, clothes that the bed clothes that he had because he was going to return. If he wasn't going to return, the uh, Hebrew custom was to just leave it crumpled and you're done. You're not coming back. But Christ folded his clothes because he's coming back and he's going to use them again or not necessarily those clothes, but it's a sign that he's coming back to these people. Um, so when the Hebrews use um, their napkins at Passover, they don't believe what Christ did, but in hopes that he's coming, that a Savior is coming, they will fold their napkin like their Savior is supposed to do when he's coming back to them. And then some good commentaries on the whole Bible. Um, he recommends Matthew Henry's commentary, the Christian Worker's commentary on the whole Bible, and James M. Gray's What the Bible's All About. Or sorry, that one's by uh, Mears. Um, James M. Gray was Christian Worker's commentary on the whole Bible. And then Through the Bible, a series by J. Vernon McGee. Um, if any of those, I would go with Matthew Henry and Through the Bible. Uh, J. Vernon McGee is a timeless preacher. Um, my brother was in the car with my dad one day, and they were listening, and it's like, Dad, he's talking about the president now. Son, he's been dead for 10 years. Just timeless truths. Um, J. Vernon McGee was a preacher that, outstanding among others. Um, I don't know that you could equate him to a Spurgeon, but of his time, he was the great Spurgeon of his day. Um, and then there's all sorts of other commentaries on individual books. Um, John R. Rice did some on Exodus. Um, just a huge list of people on other books. And if you want a commentary on a certain book of the Bible, talk to Jason. He is a librarian of himself. Um, 
and he's got more books than most pastors that I know. So, and if he doesn't have it in book form, he can print it out for you because he has more of those on his computer than he does in book form now. Um, it is. But for Bible interpretation, uh, Dr. Bernard gives us, Thou shalt and thou shalt not. Thou shalt not impose another meaning on a word, verse, or passage other than the ordinary rules of grammar in, of, in diction definary, definition, dictionary definition will support. Uh, unless the context makes it clear, a figure of speech is indicated. Thou shalt not lift a text from its context to build a pretext. Do not ignore the body of truth on a subject and only appeal to the verses that support your thesis or your beliefs. Consider the context and compare scripture with scripture to understand the whole truth on a subject. A good rule is if you can't find it more than one verse or passage that teaches a truth. It probably is not a truth. Thou shalt not read the Bible simply out of idle curiosity. Like I said, don't just put your finger in the Bible somewhere and well, what does it say? Because God might talk about a man using the bathroom on a wall. Well, what does that apply? <laughs> um, the New Testament records New Testament records truth I'm doing it out of context. Let me try that again. Thou shalt not read the Bible out of simple idle curiosity. The Bible's truth is meant to be applied. The Old Testament characters and, even, and events are examples to admonish us. The New Testament records tr records truths to instruct us. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the spiritual drink. For they that spiritual, for of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, and they also lusted. Neither there, neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand men. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and destroyed the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples that they are written for our admonition from upon whom the ends of the whole world are come. So like I said, the Old Testament is to admonish us. New Testament more so is to encourage us. Is everything in the Old Testament to admonish us? No, we have Psalms and Proverbs. But as a whole, it's telling us, hey, don't do what they did. Where New Testament is say, hey, do this, so you'll get this. Thou shalt not misapply truth meant for another dispensation, time, people, or place. Um, dispensation, there's different times in the Bible that are called a dispensation. Um, and so we are in what's considered a dispensation or the age of grace. Um, Thou shalt surely search for the first references to a subject or truth in the Bible that will provide a foundation for its treatment through the Bible. Genesis is the seed plot of the Bible. If a doctrine of truth cannot be found in Genesis, it is not a very profound truth because most of them are in Genesis. Thou shalt surely uh, yep, thou shalt surely diligently seek for the full reference and illustration of a subject of, uh, or a truth. God gives full revelation on every truth somewhere in the Bible. So this is where your topical comes in. Is you've been reading through your Bible every year, but you found a topic you're really interested in. Search the whole thing out. Don't just focus on one little tiny bit because you might miss part and tell someone else wrong. Thou shalt sh surely p pursue the progression of revelation of a revelation on truth through the Bible. It will complement 
and never contradict. So if you're studying one topic and you're going through, it's never going to say the opposite about the same topic. Thou shalt surely take notice of repeated words in a passage or chapter book. Oftentimes, repeated words is a central theme of a passage. Um, for example, the eyes in Romans 7 and spirit in Romans 8. Those are the topics of that Bible. God is focusing on those things. Thou shalt surely observe the principles and prophecies of near fulfillment and far, ful far fulfillment. Uh, many times in a historical event, forecast a prophetical ex fulfillment or what's going to happen. Um, and lastly, thou shalt surely look for the Lord Jesus Christ in every page of the Bible. The Bible is God's written word. Jesus is God's living word. And he is a subject, subject of the Bible in the whole Testament. He is concealed in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he's concealed. In the New Testament, he is revealed. So if we're not looking for Christ on every page of the Bible, why are we reading the Bible? Uh, I've ran a little long, but let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. I ask that you just help us to apply what we've taken today, and we might be able to not only read your word more, but understand your word more so, Lord. In your name, amen. <laughs>